working. And is it all working good? We're going live. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Aiden, and this is a live drawing demonstration and Q and A. Now, uh, I had some questions asked in sort of December last year, and it's taken a while to get around to answering them. But while I'm doing this demonstration, I'll be answering some of those questions which I've got written down here so that I can remember what they are. But um, last week I put out a poll and you had a choice of Joe Byrne or Owen Suffolk to have a picture drawn of. And overwhelmingly it was a decision to have Joe Byrne. So uh, that is what we're going to be doing in this particular demonstration. So. I'm going to be doing a picture of Joe Byrne before your very eyes, at the same time as answering some questions that you've posed to me. So, um, welcome to everyone who's watching, and uh, I suppose we should get cracking. Hey. All right, so I've got my paper here and a pencil. The type of drawing that I'm going to be doing is uh, line drawing basically, so not painting or something like that. Um, it's very old fashioned style where all of the shading and everything is done with little lines, which you'll see as we go on. But the first step to doing an illustration is of course, working out where everything is. So that's what I'm gonna be doing now. So I only wanna do a picture of Joe sort of from here up. Um, I'm going to mark out, roughly speaking, where everything is going to be situated. Now, I've got an idea in my head of how it's going to look when it's finished. Um, I want him to be holding a pistol because he's a bush ranger. And this is just very rough to sort of give me an indication of sizing and placement and then now that we've done that it'll be a lot easier for me to fill in the rest of it so as you can see there's it's very ephemeral you know there's not much there so one of the things that I like to do first is work on the face because the face is what we recognize. It's the thing that kind of defines how a person looks. Now I've done lots of drawings of Joe. So I know, roughly speaking, where I need to be going with this. So Joe had a very long face and a very narrow chin, big ears. That kind of stuck out at the top and came in. He had a very narrow bridge that popped out just a little bit and came to a bit of a point. Now, one of the things that um, is interesting is that. A lot of people think that Joe had a broken nose because in some of the photographs of him on the Benalla lockup after Glen Rowan, it looks slightly bent. But um, sometimes people just have a slightly bent nose um, and it's you know, very, very subtle. Um, Joe typically seemed to have one eyebrow arched a little bit. very feathery eyebrows. Small round eyes with heavy lids. Now if you were to compare the uh, the Bray photo of Joe which I was using in you know the the promos leading up to this um, you'll see that he has quite pale eyes which would have been blue in colour, 
but because of the way that uh, the lighting worked in the old days, um, it would have been very, very difficult to capture that very well on those old cameras. So they look kind of um, really pale and almost not there, whereas someone with much darker eyes it would be very, very apparent. Um, and a lot of the time, when you had people who had very pale eyes, the photographer, after developing the photograph, would have to use a special ink pen to put in the eyes so that you can actually see where their eyes were. But we don't need to worry about that because we're just doing a, an illustration. Now, in Ian Jones's books, he kind of insinuates that um, Joe had a cleft palate, a hair lip, um, which when you look at the pictures, he didn't. He just had a very um, unusually small and curvaceous upper lip, which, you know, happens. Um, he had no deformities or anything to speak of. He had a prominent lower lip and he had a very prominent forehead. Um, for such a young man, he seemed to have very um, receding hairline. So I just sort of roughly put that in there. He always parted it on this side. The fact that he parted it on this side, funnily enough, seems to indicate that he was in fact right-handed. Because, you know, you use the right hand to brush it across that way. That's one of the reasons why when you look at the, uh, the pictures of Ned Kelly at his trial in Beechworth after Glen Rowan, his hair's parted on the opposite side because he couldn't use his right hand to comb. So there's a little bit of trivia for you. Anyway. Uh, we're going to be doing Joe in the outfit he would have been wearing at Glen Rowan. So now that we've got the face there, we're going to try and put in the scarf. And he was wearing a blue sack coat. So we'll do that as well. So um, roughly start doing that here. We'll add the beard in later. Now we've got people uh, who are watching this live at the moment. Good. Well, welcome to everyone who's watching. Now, um, while I'm doing this, I'll start asking, sorry, answering one of the questions that we had uh, posed to us. So, uh, Nathan Milne, what has he got here? Um, oh, yes. So we had some questions about Blood and Thunder. Blood and Thunder is a short film that I co-wrote with Matthew Holmes, who's the director of The Legend of Ben Hall. And the basic gist of it is it's a dramatization of Stringy Bark Creek. And it's a prelude to Glen Rowan. Um, so what Nathan Milne wants to know is how Lonigan's death will be portrayed in Blood and Thunder. Um, because there is obviously some ambiguity about how he died. Um, so we know that McIntyre didn't believe that Lonigan was hiding and coming up the fire when he was shot. Um, Ned Kelly said that he had ducked down and he was coming up the fire when he was shot. We had to sort of look at that and then look at the evidence from Dr. Reynolds, who did the post-mortem, and figure out, roughly speaking, how would he have died? Well... The wounds that he had to his body, he had a wound through the left forearm, a, a bullet was stuck under the skin of his left thigh, and there was a bullet that had cut across his forehead, and the other one, the one that killed him, lodged in his brain through his right eye. What this could indicate is that he had his left side to Ned Kelly, and he was looking over his shoulder when he was hit. So, chances are... He was going for his gun, and that was when he was shot. So that's pretty much where we came from, and we figured that that indicated that he was probably running 
while he was shot. So he's not, you know, taking an aim at Ned. He's not hiding behind a log. Um, he's running for cover while trying to pull out his pistol, and that's when he gets shot. That's just the conclusion that we came to. It seems like the one that makes the most sense. So hopefully, you know, when you look at the evidence, that matches up. And that's pretty much been our whole attitude to dramatising anything to do with the Kelly story. You take the two different sides, you take the available evidence that sort of doesn't have a side, and you mix it all together to come to the most logical conclusion. And um, sometimes it marries up with what people expect, sometimes it doesn't, and you just have to kind of wear that. But um, that's, that's how you tell stories, really, isn't it? Anyway, uh, so hopefully that answers that question. Now, what I'm going to work on now is Joe's hand holding a, a revolver. I decided that he's going to hold the Colt Navy because they were the guns that uh, the Kelly gang stole from the police in Drilldry. They were a police issue at the time. So, one of the things that it's interesting about the Colt Navies is they're American guns. And for whatever reason, um, all the American pistols had very short um, grips. So it often resulted in the hand not being able to sit very comfortably around the grip of the revolver. Um, whereas a lot of the European ones had more kind of ergonomic handles. But uh, the Colt Navy was a very popular weapon. It was a 1951 model that they used. So it must have been good if they'd been using it between 1850s and the 1880s. Um, I believe it was a Civil War weapon. Um, but not being a very mechanically minded person myself. I've had to really teach myself how to understand how the guns work. So these little dimples, these little you know notches in the, the barrel there, that's where the firing caps went. And when you fired the gun, you had the hammer, which is this bit that comes off here, and that would hit the firing cap, and that was what was going to make the the bullet shoot out. So the bullets were in here, the firing cap would explode, boom, bullet comes out. Whereas later types of ammunition would have all of that stuff in the, the cartridge. Um, the Colt Navy was a single action revolver, which meant that you had to cock it and then fire, and you had to do that every time you fired the gun. So it's not like uh, modern revolvers where you can just pull the trigger and it goes bang, bang, bang. Um, and that's the reason why in a lot of those cowboy movies that everyone's sort of seen, um, you have the, the cowboys rapid firing with their pistols. They hold the gun and they go bang, bang, bang because they're holding down the trigger and by pulling back the hammer, it's called fanning and it moves the, the barrel around a lot quicker. Um, but when you've got double action revolvers, that was no longer necessary. So these guns were also very accurate for the time, um, which is one of the reasons why they were so popular. Now there's a lot of examples of the, these particular pistols around. Um, Ned Kelly was using one when he was captured at Glen Rowan. And you can go and see that one on display in the old Melbourne jail. It's got a big chunk taken out of the grip where uh, a bullet hit Ned in the hand. Um, so there was a little armature which came down here. And the armature was part of the, uh, the reloading process. You kind of see it in... Um, a couple of films like The Legend of Ben Hall demonstrates that you can push the, the bullets out of the chamber and stuff using the armature. It unclips and 
holds down um, the 1851 Colt Navy's had an octagonal barrel, which I don't know if that made it any more accurate than a round-barreled gun, but that was that was what it was. Anyway, um, so roughly speaking, this is where the pistol should be. Now, one of the things about the way that Joe dressed is that he had rings on either hand. On his left hand, on the pinky, he had Scanlan's ring, and on this finger, he had a plain band which he had taken from Constable Lonigan. And you can see that in, um, I think it's the full version of Lint's photograph of Joe on the lockup, where you can see that hand at the bottom. So now we're just going to fill in a bit more of the, the outfit. And this is where all the wrinkly bits of the sleeve are because it's all bunched up at the elbow. Now, what other questions do we have? Uh, Rodney McLaughlin asked, what was the Kelly Yang's armour made of? Well, that one's quite an easy one to answer. The Kelly Yang armour was made out of um, sort of quarter inch thick um, steel mould boards. Um, so we're talking iron, uh, it was taken off ploughs. So it's a big curved plate of iron, which they took off the plough, they heated it up, they bashed it into shape and they riveted and bolted it together. Each suit uh, would have weighed about 40 kilos, um, give or take, because they're all made very individually. But um, that obviously is a lot of weight to be carrying around, and that was one of the reasons why it was so uh, impractical. Um, Ned Kelly walking around heavily wounded, carrying almost the same body weight as himself, and he wasn't going to get very far, but um, you know, it stopped the bullets, so the bits where he was wearing the armour, he was protected. It's just the other bits that was a problem. So hopefully that answers that question. Have we had any questions coming in? No? Okay. I have George over here holding the camera for me. I'm not using voodoo magic or anything to try and make the camera move. Um, but I think you're doing a very good job so far. Um, hopefully other people agree. Um, so let's get back to this. Now, the, uh, the type of coat that Joe was wearing at Glen Rowan was known as a sack coat. You can still get sack coats, but they don't make them the way they used to. Um, they were kind of uh, typified by being uh, a shorter cut than what most coats and jackets at the time were, um, sort of terminating around about the hips. Um, and they had a very short, high collar, or lapels rather, and they usually had um, a big pocket on the breast and on either side. Um, and they were sort of popular amongst a lot of the bush rangers from the 1860s onwards because um, they were very lightweight and they didn't hang over the horse when they were riding them. So that's pretty much what Joe was wearing. He was wearing a blue one. Um, he, he enjoyed colour, I suppose. Um, but at the end of the day, when he was pulled out of the, the siege, uh, out of the, the fire at the inn, um, his coat must have been ripped or something, because when we see the photos of him hanging on the lock-up door at Benalla, he, uh, he's not wearing his jacket, he's not wearing his coat, it's all sort of bunched up on his arm, so who knows the reason for that, but um, yeah, so that's about what we need it to be, um, I'm going to pencil in the beard and the moustache, and then I think we should be about ready to begin the next step of the operation, um, which is the fun bit, well, I say it's the fun bit,
you might not think it is. All right, so I'm going to turn this over to you so you can have a look. What do you reckon? Does that look like Joe Burns so far? I hope so. Otherwise, I'm not doing my job. Okay. So, um, what I might do, actually, stay there. I have, yes, here we go. Uh, this is one of my favourite Bush Ranger books. This is Stand and Deliver by Alan M. Nixon. I use this quite a lot. Um, it's been one of the ones that's been in my collection for years. But the reason I pulled it out is because on the back cover we have a Colt Navy revolver like the one that we should have here. And it's in the same kind of position. So using this, I'm going to double check that I've got it correct. And anything that I haven't got right, I'm going to fix up. So let's have a look. So we've got that right. There's a little divot there for the bullets. Um, there's little notches here that help it to uh, move. Um, just use this to soften that up. Okay. So it's important to realise that uh, when you are drawing pictures from memory, you will get things wrong. There's no shame in that. So if we got it right all the time, we can make an absolute killing. Anyway, um, yeah. Well, this is good. It means I've remembered most of the details correctly. Yep. And... Now, I feel I should also point out that one of the reasons why I'm making sure that this is done properly is because this illustration and the one that I'll be doing tomorrow of Ben Hall are uh, actually prizes for the Fan Art February competition. So uh, the whole point of Fan Art February is to celebrate what we love about these stories and this history. Um, and, you know, get a bit creative with how we express that fascination. And, um, you know, the, the prizes should reflect that, I think. Um, all right. Okay. How's that looking? Looking good? All right, put that down there. All right, now this is the part where it's not only fun for me, this is, you know, where I get to switch off a little bit. Um, it's also nerve wracking sometimes because if I'm using a pen that I haven't used before, it can go wrong really easily. So, um, let me have a look. Where are you? There we go. Yeah, that's it. All right, so I haven't really used this pen much before, but it's just a 0.4 fine liner. These are the ones that kids take to school, um, and it's what I cut my teeth on. So I'm used to using stuff like this. Okay, now before we go on there, let's see, Joey Redman has asked, uh, will you be basing Joe's appearance in Glen Rowan, the movie, on the post-mortem photos? Well, that seems like a very relevant question. Yes, we will be. 
um, because those photos were taken just after Glen Rowan, he was still wearing the clothes he died in. So we'll be basing his appearance on that. Obviously, we'll be using slightly different clothes as well as those because he was wearing coats and stuff at Glen Rowan that he wasn't wearing in those photos. So we've used the witness descriptions, we've used the photographs, and we're going to put that all together to make Joe's look, um, which is pretty much what we've got here. So um, I'm going to start with the pistol, I reckon. I'll start inking in the pistol. Um, here we go. Some people find this part fascinating. I hope you do. Do you find it interesting, George? Yeah, I do. Just <laughs> because it's Joe. Yeah. Um, you'll probably, if you pop over and see um, an Outlaws journal, you'll see a lot of my Joe Byrne illustrations over there. I highly recommend it. Um, okay. So the reason I've chosen to uh, do this bit first is because I have a nasty tendency to drag my hand across the image sometimes when I'm inking it. And I don't want this to get too smudged, otherwise it'll make it harder for me to know where I'm putting bits and pieces in the image. So the more complicated stuff I'm going to do first. Probably should have erased the lines a little bit more because it's having a bit of difficulty getting the ink across the pencil lines. But that's all right. That's better. So have we got many people watching at the moment, George? Uh, five at the moment. Five. Now I can count that on one hand. Yeah. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to just pop them in. Um, and George will read them out to me and I'll do my best to answer them while we're going. Um, Yeah, we're getting there. So, have we got any other questions here? Oh, yes. Um, so, we had a couple of questions that were quite lengthy and um, detailed. So, I actually wrote them out verbatim um, so that I could answer them properly. Uh, the first one is from Nathan Milne. And he says, uh, what are your opinions on the work of Doug Morrissey, Stuart Dawson, and Grant Keyser? Do you find their perspectives on the killing outbreak balanced and well-researched? Or do they create more questions than they answer? And uh, so I'll answer that part first, because it's a two-part question. Um, short answer, um, I think that as far as being balanced, not so much. Um, they're obviously very much in the anti-Kelly camp, and that's fine, because we have lots of pro-Kelly authors as well. Um, variety is the spice of life. They provide a different perspective, and I highly encourage people to read their works to get an idea of what the alternative perspective is. But at the last word, no, they're not the last word, even though they say they are. Everyone who writes seems to think that they've got the definitive account, um, but as we've discovered, every time someone writes something new about the story, it opens up a whole new perspective on the way that the story unfolded. So um, what authors like Doug Morrissey and Stuart Dawson and Grant Keyser have done is they've enabled people to sort of look at the story in a slightly different way and to kind of question their existing beliefs about the story. Um, Stuart Dawson uh, is a good example of that. Very academic in his approach, um, has done some really, really good solid research, 
but because he comes at it with a very anti Kelly perspective, he kind of seems to look to validate his opinion rather than just taking the facts as they are. Um, and, you know, that's his prerogative. You know, he provides all the research. You read his stuff, he tells you where he got the information from. You can check him out. His sources are solid. Um, his interpretation is his interpretation, and that's fine. Um, Doug Morrissey, obviously, is probably the most stridently anti-Kelly person. But, um, you know, it takes all sorts. Um, the second part of the question is, on a similar note, uh, what is your what are your feelings about Leo Kennedy's book Black Snake being praised by those on the anti Kelly side of the debate as a credible take on the Kelly story, despite the author betraying his aim of telling the real story of Ned Kelly? Does their support for the book in regards to how Ned is written undermine their reliability as experts and mythbusters? Um I'm going to say no, it doesn't. Um, it's a tricky one because obviously Leo Kennedy has written his book from the perspective of someone who has inherited that kind of intergenerational trauma of having someone whose ancestor was murdered. Um, and that you can see all throughout the book, that's what's driven his perspective. And that's perfectly valid because that is something that happens. Um, the thing that I find troubling is that simply because of the fact that it is anti-Kelly, the people who are anti-Kelly jumped on board with it, um, and praised it, not based on its own merits as a book, but simply because it was the perspective that they favoured. Um, there are a lot of things in Leo's book which are inaccurate, and there are sources that he lists, and when you check the sources, they don't match what he's described based on that information um, in many cases. And that's a, that's a sign that the, the book is very biased. Um, I personally think that the book is good, but it could have been better. Um, and it would have been better if it was more about the Kennedys and less about Ned Kelly. But obviously the idea behind writing the book in the first place was more to tear down the idea of Ned Kelly than it was to build up the idea of Sergeant Kennedy. And again, that's his prerogative as an author. I think that unfortunately that has kind of um, tainted the work a little bit, but um, it's still worth a read. I highly recommend reading Black Snake if only to get an idea of the Kennedy story, uh, which I found absolutely wonderful. So, you know, you, you get all kinds of things in these texts, some things that are good, some things that are bad, you get from it what you wanted to get from it. So um, if you haven't read Black Snake, do so, but don't go into it expecting to have a fair and balanced view of Ned Kelly. Go into it expecting that you're going to have Ned Kelly painted as a monster, uh, because that's the perspective the book takes, and it's not, you know, it doesn't hedge around it, doesn't pussyfoot around trying to make out that it's anything other than that. So, you know, it, it does what it says on the cover, I suppose. Um, anyway, back to this. So that was a very interesting um, two-pronged question, I think. Um, but uh, we'll go back to this because it's a little bit less contentious to draw a picture. Um, that's the problem with this history that, you know, because there are so many unanswered questions and there are so many um, opposing perspectives, um, anyone can sort of have their own take on it and feel perfectly justified in saying that it's the truth. Um, because truth in itself is kind of a subjective concept. And um, a good example of the truth as a subjective concept is Peter Carey's novel, True History of the Kelly Gang, which that's kind of the main theme. It's a theme that Peter Carey goes to quite often. Um, but it's that thing of the unreliable narrator 
you know, the book's called True History of the Kelly Gang, not the true history, just true history, um, because it's true in the sense that this is, you know, Ned's account in the context of the book. So it's his truth rather than a fact-based, um, you know, objective truth. So what I'm doing here is I'm just going over the pencil lines to get the outline. And then, once I've got the outline, I can start shading it. And the shading method that I use is called cross-hatching, which you'll notice from any of the old uh, etchings and things um, that, you know, we see of bushrangers, it's where you have um, lines that cross over each other, and the closer together they get, the darker the, uh, the shading is, which I'll show you in a minute. I'll do the face last because that's the most detailed part apart from the gun. Um, and it's much easier to get that bit wrong, which I have done many times. But every time you make a mistake, you learn and you don't do that mistake again. Unless you haven't learned the lesson properly. So, here we go. Uh, have we had any new people joining in? No, that's all right. It's Thursday night. They're probably out shopping. <laughs> if I had the money to be out shopping, that's where I would be. That's all right. So... As I said, this is uh, going to be used as part of the prize for Fan Art February. We're still waiting for submissions. Uh, I have a cat who wants to come in. She's not used to the door being closed there, so hopefully she'll uh, realise that she can't come in. Anyway, um, so this one is going to be a prize for the literary component of the competition. The reasoning for that... Oh, she found a way in. Close that. There we go. Um, Joe Byrne, as we know, was a very literary bushranger. That's why the choice was between him and Owen Suffolk. Owen Suffolk, obviously uh, not as well known, but he was a bush ranger who did time in Pentridge and was known for writing poetry. And Joe Byrne wrote letters and he was the co-author of Ned Kelly's Geraldry Letter. So I figured if that part of the competition is all about writing and literature, well then obviously you've got to have a literary bush ranger as part of the prize. So, whoever it is that uh, submits the best short story or poem or essay or whatever it is that they, they choose to submit that's in the written form, uh, this finished product could eventually be coming your way. All right. So, as you can see, the lines are very rough, but once I'm shading it, you won't notice that. Okay. okay. So, um, let's see. I've got a question here from... D. Carruthers. D. Carruthers often likes to ask me very long winded questions. Um, let's go with this one. So, D. asks, if I may, I would like to ask a question about the Glen Rowan movie. You say in the synopsis that the gang's goal was to derail a train of policemen and start a revolution. Given your insistence in the past that your movie is going to be entirely based on historical evidence and facts rather than a novel or opinion, I wonder if you can say what facts and what evidence you have 
that the Kelly gang was planning a revolution and exactly what kind of revolution was it going to be. Now, um, most people just assume that the story of the Kelly gang trying to form a republic of northeastern Victoria is the unequivocal truth. Um, there is no recorded evidence that this is the case. Um, but at the same time, when you look at what they were doing there at Glenrowan with their armour, with blasting powder in big kegs, with fireworks to set off as signals, you've got to consider the fact that there was something much bigger on the horizon than just killing a bunch of cops. You know, it's a lot of effort to go to just to commit a murder. So it's got to have been something much bigger. Now, it also is a very important fact that Ned considered himself to be at war with the police. And that's what we mean by the, the revolution is that, you know, this is Ned trying to sort of uh, play up the political side of his persona. He is someone who kind of bought his own press, as it were. And so the idea of them doing this as a revolutionary act stems more from the fact that, yeah, Ned had these kind of um, bits of rhetoric in the drill drill letter and stuff which indicated that he was trying to do something much bigger than simply murder. On top of which, there's the fact that um, it wasn't his modus operandi. He didn't just go around killing people willy-nilly. It had to have been part of something bigger. So we had a lot of time looking at Ned's character and, you know, trying to ascertain what was going through his head because when you're writing a story, you have to understand your characters. Otherwise, it doesn't ring true. And if you don't understand your characters and it doesn't ring true, then you're not doing your job as a storyteller because people will notice. So we had to look at what Ned was doing. We had to try and understand his perspective and understand what it was that drove him to do what he did. And what it came down to was that this was obviously an act of some kind of war. Um, if it was a revolution, it would not have been a very good one because the plan didn't really seem like it would go much further than what it was at Glen Rowan. It was revenge that motivated Ned pretty much rather than, you know, thinking he was going to be the president of the Republic. So in a roundabout way, that's kind of what we were going with there. But to say revolution makes a little bit more sense to someone who doesn't know the politics behind the story and all that kind of thing. So, you know, the synopsis is not a detailed summary of the story, and it, nor should it be. Um, so that's kind of the gist of it anyway. Now, how long have we been going for, roughly speaking, George? Mm, I have no idea. <laughs> um, the only reason I ask is because, obviously, you can see this is quite a long process. Once uh, you get started, it can take hours to finish a piece like this. Um, and there is a good chance that that's what's going to happen. Um, but there we go. If you have a look at the, the style of the shading, you can see they're just little lines across over each other. And the closer they are, the darker it looks. Pretty lo-fi, but uh, that's it. So um, if the video cuts out abruptly, it's because my phone died. Um, but we'll do our best to try and get as much of this picture done for you while the phone is still good to go. Have we had any questions or anything coming through on the messages? And, no, no, not yet, no. That's all right. Um, if you are watching this after the initial broadcast and you have some questions, feel free to add them in the comments. And we will be doing another one of these videos, hopefully tomorrow about lunchtime, um, unless life has other plans. And uh, any questions that you ask there, um, we can answer them, or I can answer them, um, tomorrow when we do our Ben Hall demonstration.
Um, and then obviously if this is um, not finished by the end of this video, um, I'll be able to show you the finished product tomorrow as well. So it's a lot of this kind of stuff, just lots of little lines over and over and over. And uh, this is one of the reasons why I have problems with carpal tunnel. Um, So one of the things that some of you may have noticed is that um, there hasn't been as many new articles of late. And there's a reason for that. Um, I'm experimenting with a new format whereby there's only one feature article every month. This month it was the one about the Kelly Gang braiding jewellery. Uh, next month it's going to be an article about Michael Howe. And then... The month after that, I believe I've got an article on Matthew Brady bailing up uh, the town of Sorrel in Tasmania. So um, the reason I'm doing it that way is because it gives me more time to do the research and the writing that I need to do in order for the, uh, the thing to turn out properly. Um, I don't want to rush myself and turn out something that I'm not happy with, and I want to make sure that my information is as accurate as possible because we want to make sure that these stories are preserved accurately. Um, but the other reason is that uh, I've been working on some books. Yes, that's right, books. Um, I've written a novel about Glen Rowan. Um, it ties in with the, the film that I've co-written with Matthew Holmes. Um, it does deviate from the screenplay in a number of ways, um, which is partly because when you're writing in a long form, you can do that. Um, the screenplay is a much more condensed version of the story. Uh, but I've also been working on a novella to go along with it, um, which goes into more detail about what happened with Stringy Bark Creek and with Constable Fitzpatrick. And so, hopefully, um, both of those will be available in some form um, later on in the year. Um, the novella probably will be available first um, as an ebook on Amazon, where you can get one year of a guide of, of Australian bush ranging. Um, you can get that to read on your Kindle. Um, but at the moment you can't get that one in a hard copy, but the, uh, the novella, hopefully you will be able to. That's the aim. So I know some people don't have Kindles or the software to read Kindle files. And you'll want to read this one, it's really good. Even if I do say so myself. And then, uh, yeah, on top of that, obviously, there's all the stuff that I was doing with Matthew Holmes about the, the films. They're still coming along, but getting films made in Australia is a very, very difficult process because acquiring funding is extremely hard. It's not like in America where you have funding from studios that make millions and millions of dollars. Um, most Australian films would be lucky to have a budget of maybe $10 million, if that. Um, and we're asking for half of that for Glen Rowan. Um, but finding private investors is very difficult. And if we went through somewhere like Screen Australia, we'd have to jump through a lot of hoops, and then we might not even get any funding from them anyway. So, you know, it makes it difficult. But we know that the script that we've got is a corker, We've had a bunch of people reading it and giving us feedback, and we've got a lot of fans based on that. Um, because we don't take sides. Why should you take a side in telling a story about history? You just show things as they happen, and people can make their own minds up. And uh, there's a number of scenes that we had to cut out of the screenplay that would have really had the audience questioning certain characters. 
And you never know, if we get enough funding, we might be able to film those scenes and have them as extras on a Blu-ray release. But you have to make the film before you can do any of that kind of stuff. But Blood and Thunder was always part of that process. Um, originally, we had scheduled Blood and Thunder to be filmed after the initial photography for Glen Rowan uh, because there are flashbacks and things to Stringermark Creek that occur in Glen Rowan. And you can't put flashbacks in unless you have filmed something to do with that part of the story. Um, and then uh, we sort of were discussing the potential of bringing the production on that forward and doing it as a prequel. And that's the reason why we were talking about it at the end of last year. Unfortunately, due to scheduling conflicts, we've had to put that on hold. And so we're just sort of back to our original plan of doing that, you know, once the initial photography for Glen Rowan's done. But uh, Blood and Thunder is just a short feature. It's not a full-length feature the way the Glen Rowan is. Um, and it's just a way of exploring the events which resulted in, eventually, what happened at Glen Rowan. And sort of, it's there to help us understand the, the context of where all that came from. How's that looking so far? Obviously it looks a lot different than it did to start with. Um, the more cross-hatching that I do, the more detail will come into the picture. Um, and, you know, it sort of takes shape as, as it goes along. Which, you know, I think you can sort of see that. All right, so, um, do you reckon I should do some uh, of the outlines on the face? I reckon that, now that you've seen how the shading works, I'll do the face. Now I'm gonna use this, this particular pen. Um, I don't know much about it, it's graphic. I, I was given these pens, but I use this one because it's a very fine line and because it doesn't have as much ink in it, um, there's less chance that I'm going to stuff up. I can, I can have a bit more control over it. And control is very important because when you're doing something that has a lot of detail in it, and very precise detail as well, I might add, um, You want to have something that's not going to, you know, stuff up and cover your picture in blobs of ink and things like that, which all too often does happen when you've got newer pens and things like that. It frustrates me. So you can see I've spent a lot of time studying Joe Byrne's face. I know exactly how he looked. He was definitely the, the most handsome member of the gang. And because of that... He's often considered the lady killer, in a metaphorical sense, not in a literal sense. And he had his uh, girlfriend Maggie at the Vine Hotel in Beechworth that he would go and visit on the weekends. Joe was a very passionate person, a very articulate person, but there was different sides to him. He kind of had a Jekyll and, uh, Jekyll and Hyde quality, which 
meant that the side of him that you saw wasn't necessarily the side that other people saw. You know, um, the Kellys would have seen the larrikin side of him and the intelligence side of him that uh, you know Aaron Sherritt would have seen, but Sherritt would have also seen uh, the sensitive side of him and the the criminal side of him as they were doing things like stealing cattle to butcher. Um, you know, there was a side of him where he treated women very well um, and he treated strangers with reservation but with respect. You know, he was a, a very complex individual and that's one of the reasons why I've always found him fascinating. But, uh, you know, most people just think, oh, he was the one who slept around and smoked opium. There's so much more to him than that. Um, and again, if you pop over to an Outlaw's Journal, you'll see some of that. Because very few people have done the sort of research on Joe Byrne that George has. And I feel very privileged to be involved in that. Because uh, there's some stuff that's been coming out in her research that is pretty remarkable, that it's never been sort of uh, found before. And that's one of the benefits of having a system like Trove that exists, where you can have access to all kinds of things without having to spend hours in old libraries and things like that. Have we had any new people joining in to see what's going on? Mm, no. Not really, no. That's all right. Doing illustrations like this has always been a, a good part of learning the stories as well, because they often say, a picture paints a thousand words. And I think that's true, because humans are very visual creatures. Um, and I'm a very visual creature. I learn a lot through observation. And because of that, I know that uh, if I'm studying a face to do an, a portrait and that sort of thing, I can learn a lot about that person. So I'll just uh, plug again. If you like this illustration, and you'll probably like it better when it's finished, but if you like it and you want to have it, um, you can enter the Fan Art February competition uh, with a piece of written text. And if we decide that yours is the best one, then this will come out to you in the mail. Once I figure out how much it will cost the post. Because I haven't sent something like this in the post for a while. But uh, submissions go to Australian Bush Ranging, one word, Australian Bush Ranging at gmail.com. Um, a very original name for a, an email account, obviously. Now, this weekend, 